Ladies and gentlemen, you may be fighting against God and not even know it. Today we have a situation where a lot of people may not be aware that they are in fact fighting against God himself. Some of us are born into this battle such as the sons of Ishmael who make up the Arab nations while others are persuaded by public opinion issued by satanic forces of darkness, the spirit of the Antichrist. If a friend tells you something negative about another person, in other words, bad-mouthing them, you will likely develop a negative bias towards that person even though you've never met them. And with a negative opinion having already been established in your mind, the chances are that you will not even give that person a chance to prove who they really are when and if you should ever meet them. The same is true concerning anti-Semitism. The secular media which gives heed to the seducing spirit of the Antichrist continually portrays Israel as, and the Jews as the source of the world's problems, a roadblock to peace. If the Palestinians, Hezbollah, Hamas, or any other anti-Jewish group launches missiles into Israel in a deliberate attempt to kill as many Jews as possible, men, women, and even children, or should I say especially children, the media plays it off as if it were Israel's fault for being there in the first place. But the moment Israel retaliates, and even though they make a genuine effort to minimize collateral damage, they are portrayed in many cases as the brutal occupiers of Palestinian territory. But this is not the main point of the discussion, and I may cover it later on if God and time permits. The reason I brought the subject of anti-Semitism into this is there is a war of good and evil being fought right now. There are only two sides to this battle, and neutrality is not an option. You are either for God or against God. If you are on the side of Israel and the Jews, then you're on God's side, but if you are not, then you are not. Now hold on a minute before you go storming off in anger, allow me to explain why I said that. I base all of my opinions on the Bible. I do not pick and choose what to believe and what not to believe. As far as I'm concerned, the Bible is the Holy Word of God. And if anyone takes a serious look at it, should be able to see that it is indeed the truth. God loves the Jews, and they are in fact his chosen people. This didn't mean that he loves the rest of us any less, or that the Jews are better than the rest of us, but what it does mean is that God chose the Jews as the people through which the nations of the world would be blessed. After all, it was through them that the Messiah Jesus came, and through, the, through him we are all able to receive salvation. So does God love the Arabs too? Yes, he does as a matter of fact. The conflict in the Middle East, though it has a spiritual side, good versus evil, it is also a family squabble. That's right, the Jews and the Arabs are brothers. They both came from the same father. Abraham, whose name was changed from Abram. Listen to what God says in Genesis 16, 1 through 4. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go in to my maid, perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her handmaid, the Egyptian and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. After Abram had dwelt, excuse me, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. After Hagar got pregnant, she became proud and haughty because she was able to, her, just a mere servant, was able to 
conceive a child, whereas her master, Sarai, was unable to do so. So all in all, it created a lot of tension between the two of them until Sarai got to the point where she came down hard on Hagar and Hagar ran away. Now in Genesis 16, 7 through 10, the angel of the Lord came to visit Hagar where she was resting at, at a water well and he told her what was going to happen and he advised her to go back to Sarai her master and submit herself to her hand. Now here, here is what it says. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to shore. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. So the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for the multitude. Well, basically what that means is there, there are going to be so many people, the sons of Ishmael, that they won't be able to be numbered. But ultimately, they will be a wild people and the world will not be able to tame them. In Genesis 16, 11 through 12, it states pretty much just that. In 11 it says, And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man, his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now what it's saying is that they are going to be a wild, untamable nation. And even though they're blessed in the sense of population growth and multitude of peoples, they're still going to be wild. And currently, they have a belief system that causes them to be totally intolerant of any other belief system or any other way of life. They, it's freedom, you know, like in America, we have freedom. You know, we have a so-called democracy. At least as far as it stands now, we can, we can say what we want to say. If we don't like the president, we can say we don't like the president. No one's going to come and stone us to death or, or chop off our heads. But in their nations over there, you need to be careful what you do. You need to be careful what you say. You need to be careful what you think. And all of the nations that, are, that live by Sharia law, there is absolutely zero freedom. You have to abide by Sharia law, including down to what you, what you think, or at least allow others to know what you think. If I lived over there, I certainly wouldn't be able to say what I'm saying right now. So the Bible description concerning the sons of Ishmael being a wild man with his hand against every man and every man's hand against him is a perfect description of what's going on right now. God did bless the Arabs with a great multitude of people. And this interesting fact is that he gave them 12 princes just as he gave the Jews, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now in Genesis 25, 12 through 16, it reads, Now this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael. By their names, according to their generations, the firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth, then Kadar, Adbil, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Massa, Hadar, Tima, Jetor, Nephish and Kadima. 
These were the sons of Ishmael, and these were their names by their towns and their settlements, twelve princes according to their nations. However, God has made an everlasting covenant with Israel. It is as valid today as it was when God first made it with Abraham. This is a covenant that transcends time and is from generation to generation. Not only is this covenant exclusive to the Jewish people, but it also includes the promised land. In Genesis verses 17, 1 through 9, when Abram was 90 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall you name no longer shall your name be called Abram but your name shall be called Abraham for I have made you a father of many nations I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. Now I have to interject something here. There is a trend going around among some Christian groups where they believe in a concept known as replacement theology. Supposedly God has severed his relationship with the Jewish nation and has replaced them with the modern day Christians. Well, this is simply not true. God has not forsaken his covenant with Israel, but instead, we Christians are the wild branch. The Gentiles that were grafted into the olive tree, which represents Israel. The Jews are not removed or replaced, but instead, we Christians are incorporated into the family of God. Now Romans 11, 24 through 25 state, for if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more will these, who are the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? That's speaking of the Christians and the Jews. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that hardening in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. God had made a promise to Abraham that this covenant between God and him and his seed was going to be an everlasting covenant. And there's nowhere in the Bible where you can find a contradiction to that and make it something else. It is not. They have not been replaced. The Jews are God's chosen people, not better than, but those are the ones that God chose to deal with to complete and fulfill his purposes. Now here's the part I want you guys to pay pretty close attention to. Concerning the sons of Ishmael, they have gone astray from God, the God of Abraham, the God of their father and in fact are fighting against God himself. The Arab nations are fighting to destroy Israel, who has an everlasting covenant with the God of Abraham, who is also the father of the Ishmaelites. If they are not serving the God of Abraham, then who are they serving? 
I'll leave that part up for to, you know, up to you guys to figure that one out on your own. But this is what the God of Abraham says about the situation. In Psalms 83. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace. And do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult. And those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. Who is you? That's God. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites. I'll read that again. They form a confederacy against you. Who? It's God. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarites, Jabal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined them. They have helped the children of Lot, Selah. Deal with them as with Midian, as with Caesarea, as with Jabin at the brook of Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became a refuge on the earth, Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, Zeb. Yes, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna. Who said, let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. O oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind, as the fire burns the woods. And as the flame sets the mountains on fire, so pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. Fill, your, fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them put to shame, let them be put to shame and perish that men may know that you whose name alone is the Lord or the most high over all the earth. I would suggest that you guys read Psalms 83. It clearly states who is who and what is what. And right now, unfortunate, and I do not like to say it, but I have to. I guess I've already said it. They are fighting against God. So in closing... If you go against Israel, or if you side with the enemies of Israel, then you are indeed going against God. And you as an individual, and even the nations that are doing so, will be judged. Are you saved? Follow the link below, pray the prayer of salvation, and you will be saved. Friends, it is my prayer that God bless you with ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.